At first glance, the Powkitty X51 has a lot going for it, but unfortunately the cracks appear quickly, and they are vast. Hello, and welcome to RetroBreeze. The X51, like I said, has a lot going for it. It has a big and lovely screen that's bright and colourful, a very large and responsive D-pad, funky responsive buttons, and even stacked shoulders. It has a ton of input options and ports, including Type-C for OTG and charging, a headphone jack, HDMI out which works absolutely excellently, and two USB-A ports for USB controllers. We also have stereo speakers at the bottom and a lovely volume wheel on the left hand side. The specifications of the X51 are as follows. An 800 by 480 screen that is bright and colourful and responsive, and notably with no ghosting which I find pretty rare for this price point. It sports a quad-core ATM 7051 ARM Cortex A9 processor, clocked at 900 MHz, 128 MB of RAM, and a 2500 mAh battery, which is very nice. Some extras include a movie player that supports flash video and MP4, and a built-in MP3 player. The X51 retails for $50 or so depending on when and where you buy it. This particular device was gifted to me by Mikey, who is a long-term and very good friend of the channel, so thank you so much Mikey, as always, for absolutely everything you do for me. So anyway, in the hands, the Powkitty X51 feels pretty good, because it has this kind of thick, almost clunky, but comfortable rounded design, with two rubber pads on the back for extra grip. As you can see, it borrows a lot stylistically from the Nintendo Switch, but honestly couldn't really be further from it. It's very comfortable to hold, and all the inputs are also very comfortable to reach. You never hit the sticks by mistake, the D-pad is big enough that you'll never miss it, the face buttons are also large and well-spaced, everything kind of feels pretty good when you hold it in your hands. I especially like that even though the triggers aren't analog, they are much softer than the clickier L1 and R1. It's not all perfect though, the R1 and L1 actually sound different from one another when you press them. And in addition, the function start and select buttons are so clicky and hollow and loud that it's actually embarrassing to use them. I was actually in a waiting room the other day and I grabbed the X51 just to play it as part of my tests. I had to press the function button and I was genuinely embarrassed when I pressed it because people looked in my direction. It's very, very bad. Anyway, so let's go ahead and power this on and go over the software experience first. And to be honest, it is pretty rough. There are some tabs across the top for different pages. List is just a straight up list of every game on the device, which is kind of dumb when you have thousands of games. Type is where you'll want to go most of the time. There are 10 systems playable on the device. And actually, I kind of like this theme. It's kind of, um, I don't know, mid 2000s y. No more systems are available though, so what you see here is what you get. Each system takes you into a game list with screenshots per game. There's also history, which shows your recent games, a favorites list, and you can add games to your favorites by pressing select on them, and a search function, which unfortunately barely works. I have a few games with Sonic in the title, but the search just doesn't work for it, but it does for like adventure or something like that. I'm not sure why this is, it's just kind of a mostly broken feature. Also, of course, this isn't touch screen, so you're gonna have to type using the D-pad and A button. By going into File, you can launch ROMs directly from the file, or play movies and music from the SD card. The movie and music players do function on the most basic level. They do play movies and music, but you can only pause or skip back and forth between files or tracks. You can't seek. For example, if you're halfway through an episode, you can't get back to where you were. Um, so I don't know, that's kind of useless in my opinion. There's also system settings available to change the language between Chinese and English, brightness, wallpaper, volume, perform a reset, and also you can sync your game list if you add your own games to the device. But be warned that in my experience, no matter what is on the SD card, the sync takes absolutely ages, like over 10 minutes. I had a brand new SD card with nothing on it, and I added I think maybe like 20 or 30 games, and it took absolutely ages. I was worried the thing was actually going to run out of battery, it is really bad, I don't know what the deal is here, but something's not working right. Also, for some reason, when you add a game, it just gets appended to the back of the list, regardless of the title of the game. So here's Top Gear Rally, which I added, and it's just at the bottom of the list for no reason. It doesn't go in the list alphabetically where it should, which again just makes this whole thing just kind of clunky and annoying to use especially given that the search function doesn't really work. There's also an in-game menu, which lets you save states, load states, 
do button mapping, which just remaps buttons to other buttons on the controller and not per system, if that makes sense, and a mode for setting the joysticks. The digital mode maps the sticks directly to ABXY and the D-pad, flashbacks to the A380, but the analog mode makes them function properly and as they should for PS1 games. But bear in mind they don't click down for L3 and R3, so yeah. You can also set the screen scale to full screen, which will stretch the image to the corners, or scaled, which keeps the aspect ratio. But um, this is also kind of broken in some instances, which we'll see a bit later on. And here's where the at first glance thing comes in. Because when you start playing a game, the X51 actually feels really, really good. This big screen is really, really, really nice, and it has pretty good speakers too. At first, you might be fooled into thinking this is actually a quirky but cute and capable device, but unfortunately, you'd just be wrong. And by the way, as soon as you get into the game list here, Pow Kitty really proves that you should never count on your retro handheld device coming with the games. The names of the included games are absolutely insane. Some of them are absolutely belly laughs, and others just make no sense at all, but you'll see as we go along. So we're going to start here with NES with a game apparently named Attacking Animal School. I can't say it enough, the screen is just so nice, it's so bright and big and colourful. It really punches way above its own class, especially when it comes to the fact that it has absolutely no ghosting issue at all. It's very crisp and clear. Even something like the Miu Mini has a pretty bad ghosting problem, which in my case changes depending on the temperature, but the X51 has none of that. Here's a game called Big Stone Collision, oh sorry, I mean Boulder Dash. Next up we have Game Boy Advance, I'm just going by the order they appear on the system by the way. And this game is Branch Nano Crazy Racer, um, also known as Konami Crazy Racers. I want to say that the GBA is a huge strength for the X51. The games look absolutely amazing, whether you have them scaled or stretched to full screen. And the X51 controls work just really, really nicely. And yes, that is Grey Fox from Metal Gear Solid riding a go-kart by the way. Castlevania Moonlight here, or as I like to call it, Circle of the Moon, plays very well too. This is playing unscaled. Finally, I have Top Gear Rally, which just looks amazing on the X51. However, there are a couple of minor emulation issues, like cars appearing over the track when they shouldn't. So, so far so good, right? Well again, at first glance, which is the system's tagline, because GBA does not save. That's right, you cannot save your game on GBA. You can do a save state, or any number of save states, but if you actually go into an in-game menu and save, it just doesn't work. Next time you load the game, there's no save data. And that is a massive, massive software issue with the X51 that is inexcusable, unforgivable, and in my opinion makes this entire system unplayable. Maybe that's dramatic, maybe it's not. Anyway, next up is CPS, Capcom Play System. And AVP runs absolutely perfect, but here's an example of that scale mode being glitched out. Thankfully, full screen mode works fine and looks absolutely great. I'm shocked this game runs at full screen, even with like 50 enemies on screen or however many. Really, really great. Now here's Altered Beast. Wait, on CPS? I don't think that's right. Anyway, it's totally broken with non-dying enemies and ultra slow scrolling speed. How about Art of Fighting 2? Well, that's a Neo Geo game apparently, so I'm not sure why it's in this list. Street Fighter Alpha 2, however, works really, really well, but the Palkity X51 has a kind of slippery D-pad which means that those tight directional sweeps are really hard to pull off properly. Still, I actually won this fight in Street Fighter. That's crazy! I've never won a battle in Street Fighter before. So now we're going to move on to Super Nintendo. And you might not guess this, but Super Nintendo on the X51 is inexplicably horrible. It is slow, laggy, and just awful in pretty much every game. And even in the cases where the gameplay is fine, like Donkey Kong Country for example, the input delay is noticeable and terrible. Take a look at the burst shot in R-Type. It slows the entire game to a crawl. 
And here is Mega Man X. Why is this running so slowly? There's no reason it should be this bad. Just to drive this point home, here is Super Mario World. Super Nintendo is just horrible on the X51, and for absolutely no reason. I get it if something like Yoshi's Island slows down because that's a very, very advanced game. But this is not that, this is just basic Super Mario World. There is no reason why Super Nintendo should be this bad. Now I did actually reach out to Pow Kitty on AliExpress, and I asked them specifically why Super Nintendo was so bad and is there a fix that they can provide? And they said that there is a developer currently working on improving this. I don't believe them, but if they come through, I'll let you know. Thankfully, Mega Drive Fair is a little better. Here's the Sega Classic Space Harry 2. And here is the memorable Alien Double Stupid, which is unironically the most perfect title for Toe Jam and Oil I've ever heard. That is now the true title, Alien Double Stupid. It runs absolutely great. Island Adventure, the technically correct title for Pugsy on the Mega Drive, reveals an issue with audio skip. I know the soundtrack like the back of my hand and this is not right. Take a listen. It should sound more like this. Upon a closer look and test, this is present with nearly all Mega Drive games to varying degrees. And again, this just isn't a problem that should be there. This device is more than capable of emulating Mega Drive, and it's just really disappointing to see a software issue like this. Arcade, which appears to be Final Burn Alpha, is mostly terrible. I didn't bother testing much because everything was slow and clunky, like this top-down shooter game. This just is just indicative of this system on the X51. It just doesn't really work. Next on the list is Game Boy and Game Boy Color, which both work absolutely perfect. And again, it just makes me wish that the X51 was better than it is. Because when you get into a game and you're playing it, it looks great, it feels great, and it's really, really fun when you get going with something that works. Although Game Boy does have a weird sepia color palette that can't be changed, but that's really not a deal breaker for me. Finally, we're onto Neo Geo properly, and it works pretty much perfectly on every game I tested, except for a little bit of slowdown in more advanced games like Polestar, but I kind of expect that on a handheld this cheap. And finally, we're on to the PS1, which is the last system that the X51 says it can emulate. But, as you might expect, it is not great. Many games have audio issues, like Wipeout here, which has no music and a lot of missing sound effects. However, Ridge Racer Type 4 looks and plays absolutely great. Flawless, actually. Again, I wish the X51 was like this on every system it supported. Crash Bandicoot 3 had some minor slowdown, but nothing too game-breaking. All the audio and everything worked fine, but it does reveal the X51's D-pad issue. You can actually hit perpendicular directions by tilting the edge of any button. For example, you can hold up and then tilt the D-pad left and right to move left and right. Same with down and left and right, obviously. If your finger isn't perfectly central, you'll hit the diagonal, which is just really bad in a game like Crash Bandicoot where you need to be really accurate. You need to make sure that your thumb is perfectly in the middle of the D-pad or it just doesn't really work very well. At worst, it will throw off your directional inputs and at best, it's just kind of distracting when your character crouches or just goes in the wrong direction. And then of course, there is an even bigger problem with PlayStation 1. Can you possibly guess what it is? Saving is not possible. Yes, even if you go into the in-game menu and save your game, the next time you open the game, that save will not exist, it will be gone. Save states do work again, but that is not a substitute for actually saving your game in-game as you normally would on the console itself. And it's these kinds of issues that 
I think a lot of people missed, especially other reviewers when they've been reviewing this device, I haven't heard anything about saving or about the audio skip issue on Mega Drive. And that's because I think the X51 has a handful of really glaring obvious problems like the Super Nintendo issue. But it also has a myriad of other problems like the saving, like the weird D-pad and all that stuff that I think got overlooked a lot. And when you combine all of that together, the X51 just is not a good handheld, unfortunately. By the way, I should mention, because I did have a lot of fun with this, the X51 gets HDMI output so right. You just plug in the cable and you play. There's no configuration. Everything works absolutely perfectly. It's just a really good experience. I played Sonic Advance 2 on the big screen. I recorded the gameplay, as you can see here, and it ran absolutely great. It does play on the X51 screen as well, though. But I imagine that, I don't know, if you wanted to play a two-player, Mega Drive game or something and you plugged in two controllers and the HDMI, it would technically work. However, you're probably not going to want to because everything on the X51 is just kind of poor in performance and software. And that's ultimately the summary of the Palkiddy X51. At first glance, the X51 feels pretty great. The screen is great, the controls feel pretty good, and if you jump in with a system that works like NES or a Game Boy Advance, you might have a really good time. Even if you're lucky enough to go into PS1 and choose Ridge Racer Type 4, you're probably going to have a great time and it's going to work really well. But the second that you go any deeper into this thing, it just falls apart completely. From the weird broken game lists not being alphabetical properly, to GBA and PS1 not saving at all, which to me is just a complete deal breaker. And then of course to the completely broken systems like Arcade and Super Nintendo. There's just too much wrong with the Palkity X51. At $50, you can get some pretty competitive handhelds these days. Off the top of my head, that's pretty close to an RGB 10 Pro from the same company, which is incredible. The MiU Mini, of course, is fairly close in price as well. The Trim UI Smart is $10 cheaper, even though it's a different kind of style. It's way better, technically. And there really just ends up being no real reason to buy a Palkity X51, in my opinion. Now, I want to give you my summary and my likes and dislikes, even though I think it's already pretty clear what I think about this thing. But anyway, I'm going to start with my likes. I like how the Palkity X51 feels in the hands. I think it's a very comfortable device. And to be honest, I think the design is just kind of, even though it's a ripoff of the Switch, I guess, it's just kind of quirky and strange. It's kind of boxy and clunky. It really kind of reminds me of a child's toy. Um, I can imagine there just being like a fake screen in the middle and this would be a child's toy. And I don't know, I just kind of like that to be honest. I almost like the big D-pad if it worked perfectly. I just think it needs a little bit more of a barrier between the perpendicular directions. But overall, I really like having a big D-pad on a device. That's kind of a weird positive because it's also a negative, but anyway. And the screen is just great on the X51. It's such a nice screen. It punches far above its weight class and it just makes everything look really nice. And the HDMI output is a really great experience. It just works and it works well if you're playing a game that works. And now for my dislikes. And there are so many here, it's really, really hard for me to list them all. I mean, starting off with Super Nintendo performance, there is literally no reason why it's this bad. This is just purely laziness from Palkitty on their software. Next is the just general bugginess of like every system. Other than maybe NES and Game Boy, every other system on this device has some kind of problem with it and that's just unacceptable on a consumer device that you can buy right now. The saving issues with Game Boy Advance and PlayStation, again, these make these systems totally unplayable. And no, please don't tell me that you can use save states, it's not an acceptable alternative. Save states are supplementary to real saves. The broken D-pad, because even though I love the big size of the D-pad, there's no reason to have a big nice D-pad if it doesn't work properly. And the proprietary Palkitty software. I believe it's actually based on OpenDing UX, but you wouldn't be able to tell. It's just terrible in pretty much every way. The search doesn't work, the lists don't really work, games can be in the wrong list and launch the wrong emulator, it's just bizarre and nothing really works well. Add to that the severely limited media and music player, which I don't really care about, and more importantly the way that it takes absolutely forever for the game list to sync, it's just not a very good experience. And finally, just Pow Kitty. I mean, I love the RGB 10 Pro, but this company has basically given up at this point. They literally say in their uh, like byline of their products, please accept the product with its flaws or something like that. That's just not good enough. If you're going to make consumer products, they have to be consumer quality. Yes, I know these are cheap Chinese emulation handhelds, but even so, if we keep accepting products like this and we keep buying them, they're just going to get worse and worse. These companies need to be held to a standard. 
and unfortunately Power Kitty has discovered that they don't have a standard and that they can just put out pretty much garbage, pretty much just pure e-waste and sell it and people will buy it. Actually, I was on the Pow Kitty website, but I was looking at this product just to get the spec list and it popped up in the corner saying somebody had just bought it. And like my heart sunk, I was like, oh no. And that's just such a horrible thing to think. So yeah, that wraps up my review of the Pow Kitty X51. This is probably the most like I want to love you system I've ever had because I really like the quirky clunky design, the love the big d-pad, you know, I, I just generally like it. And I like these cheap handhelds that have limited capabilities. I think that those can be really fun and serve a really good purpose. But the X51 is so much less than the sum of its parts. It just punches so low. Even though it has a great, bright, beautiful screen, it just doesn't work. Like that's just the bottom line. The console just doesn't work. And honestly, I wouldn't recommend this to absolutely anyone. What do you think about the X51? Have you picked one up? What do you think about Pow Kitty and the way that they're conducting their business? Let me know in the comment box below. If you like this video, please be sure to subscribe. I've got lots more interesting stuff coming up and I'd really appreciate it if you could leave a like on this video as well. Thanks once again to Mikey, as always, who always supports the channel and I appreciate it greatly. He's become a great friend. And of course to you for watching. This has been Shem from Retrobreeze and I look forward to seeing you again very soon.